So every three years, I like to do a list of the worst things I've reviewed in that time frame. And it's been three years since my last one, but I don't think I reviewed enough truly terrible things yet. Maybe next year. After all, that will be the 10th anniversary of the first one. But I still want to do something. So how about the best bad things I've reviewed? Yes, the best bad things. The movies or specials that are objectively bad but made me laugh or just gave me a good time despite their terribleness. These are pretty much all film exaggerations or NDTVs, but I really want to give them their due. These movies didn't infuriate me, and while they may not have given me the joy that the filmmakers intended, they still gave me joy. So, here we go. These are the top 10 best bad things I've reviewed. <laughs> Skate Dog. This gets at the bottom because it can be a bit boring, it was almost tied with the 1959 Santa Claus movie, but it manages the edge mostly due to one thing. Fucking Frankie. This character, despite barely being in the film, manages to create one of the most memorable bully characters of all time. Every line he says he thinks is the funniest thing ever. Even when he's saying isn't actually a joke. Hey Scooter, the point is to stay on your board. <laughs> Whoa, someone's gonna have a bad case of road rash. <laughs> when he tells the story of how the competition came to be, I nearly lost it. He is so pathetic. Pathetic, but he thinks he's so cool. There's other funny stuff like the really bad editing. I still don't know why they hold that shot of Mrs. Crowley putting a steak on the grill for so long. Or that shot of them walking into the house that just goes on for like 20 seconds. It has terrible sound mixing. Or the fact that Buddy, the skate dog in this movie called Skate Dog, is barely a presence. They win the approval of their investor by having a skateboarding dog in their video in a 2018 movie. And then there's the fact that the whole movie is leading this skateboard competition, and when it happens, Tommy just says, yeah, I'll never beat you. I forfeit. But that does show one thing I oddly respect about this. It's surprisingly realistic in how everyone acts. There's a dog out there. And I'm talking about Skate Dog. The character interactions feel genuine. Tommy doesn't become an expert in a few days. It does seem like the people who made it were really trying. Plus, I have a soft spot for a movie in which the main character, being a video editor, is what saves the day. Why don't we just do this right now and get it over with? Really? Psych! <laughs> New York Minute. This is probably the best film on this list objectively. Most of the editing is fine, it's shot mostly fine, most of the acting is passable for the type of movie it is. I don't think it is nearly as bad as the 11% on Rotten Tomatoes would suggest. This movie is just a fun adventure. I did at least want to see where it was going, would they get caught, would they make it to the competition. Sure, it could have been easily solved with just a quick trip to the police, and that is its main problem. It is pretty contrived. But man, I love the side characters. Max Lomax is one of the best antagonists in these tween girl movies. He's so determined to get this girl, and Eugene Levy is so perfect in this role. Then there's the Chinese mobsters whose whole plan is to sell pirated movies, music, and clothing. Like, that's the stakes in this movie. And one of them is a white guy trying to do a Chinese accent. This film is so mid-2000s, it's insane. And as someone who was a kid in the mid-2000s, I, of course, have a lot of nostalgia for that time period. So I am a bit biased in that way. When they throw that dog out the window, I had to pause the movie because I was laughing so hard. That adorable old couple were just precious. Those hairdressers who see these two white girls come in and immediately have to help them. <laughs> then they call a guy a cracker. It's a mostly boring cliche story with some of the most insane shit happening. And it is a perfect time capsule guilty pleasure. Now we're cooking with gas. Out of the way, suckers! I can't help falling in love with you. 
Plan 9 from Outer Space. Yeah, how many of you remember I reviewed this? It's one of the most classic bad movies of all time. This film is so... earnest. It is so earnest, it's clearly trying, and despite some saying it's one of the worst films of all time, I honestly don't think it's that bad from a production point of view, when considering its budget and the time it came out. Don't get me wrong, it is bad, even taking those into account, but stuff like the cheap looking sets and some of the effects I'm willing to let slide a little bit. For me, the plot itself is just ridiculous. It's about aliens bringing corpses to life to stop humans from creating a weapon that will destroy the universe. All that leads to pretty much nothing as they just break a few pieces of equipment and then the flying saucers blow up. It is so dumb, but every actor is taking it so seriously. And the thing is, some of them do a good job, or at least an okay job, given the material. And when they are bad, it's hilarious. Like, I still have no idea what Inspector Clay says here. Knock it around that the dialogue's bad, it's cheesy as hell, but it's fun. And there are good things, the music's good, it's framed fine most of the time. You can see the effort, and Ed Wood were alive, I'm sure he'd be happy that people were enjoying his film, even if it's not how he expected. Inspector Clay's dead, murdered, and somebody's responsible. Search of Santa. This one grew on me a lot. I already thought it was pretty humorous, but not only have I started enjoying it more in the past few years, my review is in my top five favorites. This movie has some very good intentions and actually teaches some lessons surprisingly well. I actually like the message that believing in Santa isn't important, it's believing in the things he stands for. That's a unique lesson that I don't see a lot. And I do like that they give the pirates another chance at changing their ways. Not sure why the terribly deep thinkers didn't get a second chance, but, you know, baby steps. So the morals are fine. The way they teach them, though, is one of the most batshit insane movies I've ever watched. This movie, apparently, takes place in a world where humans exist. But there are seagulls that are also pirates. An elf spins one of those twirly hats on a pig and then it can fly. The two main characters suck, with Crystal being incompetent and Lucy being an asshole. Crystal's friend wants to fly despite being a penguin. A seal just straight up gets eaten, <laughs> leaving her pup an orphan. It has two songs, both in the middle of the movie, and that's it. The weird politics of the penguin kingdom. There's an entire scene I had to cut out of the YouTube review where they fight a polar bear. And then, of course, there's the animation, which isn't the worst I've seen, we'll get to that, but it's awkward, it's just, it's so awkward. The movie wants to have emotional moments, and you can tell it's trying, but it can't with these character models. But again, it does have its heart in the right place, it has one legit hilarious joke, and it's well voice acted. I do really recommend this one, even if you don't want to watch it, I think the moral is good enough that if your kids want to watch it, yeah, it's fine. Whatever you're selling, I ain't buying. We're not selling anything. Oh, then get lost! Bailey's Billions. I'll keep this one brief. Tim Curry and Jennifer Tilly are hilarious in a movie about a dog inheriting millions of dollars. What's not to love? We need a lawyer. I am a lawyer. We need a good lawyer. <laughs> Long shot. This movie is insane. I've seen movies that are tonally confused. This film is genre confused. It starts as a basketball movie, okay. Then it becomes a teen comedy where the nerdy guy wants to impress the popular girl who's already dating the jerky jock. Then it becomes a mobster action film where a gigolo who slept with the wife of a mob boss is totally asked to seduce the widow 
of some guy so he can find out insider information. Then it becomes a romance with the gigolo and widow and nerdy guy and the widow's daughter. This romance somehow includes a musical number. Then it becomes a heist film before going reverse all the way back to a basketball movie. And through all of that, they managed to squeeze in a bunch of cameos from the likes of Britney Spears, NSYNC, The Backstreet Boys, O-Town, Take 5, Gilbert Gottfried, and Kenny Rogers, RIP to both of them. Also, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who somehow loses us fight with this scrawny ass white boy. And then it all ends at a Chippendales. This is where we get into the, this needs to be seen. This is insane, and I was mesmerized by it. Lou Pearlman, the writer of this, missed his calling. If he had just made movies, he wouldn't have gone to jail. To be fair, the acting isn't terrible, and it at least is competently made, which puts it above the rest of these. I adore this movie. Please, please show it to people. Like, it needs to be seen. I guarantee you, it will not disappoint. And we've lost all communication with air traffic control. I don't know what the problem is, but they've got to get in sync. Saving Christmas. This is one of those movies that actually lived up to my expectations. I spent a year hearing this is one of the most batshit Christmas movies ever made. And my god, it is. Now I will say, on rewatches, it does have a few more boring parts. It's not a movie for everyone. I don't think it's a movie I could watch every year, but every four years. I know this because I watched it in 2015 for the review, 2019 for the worst picture video, and 2023 just for fun. And each time I did get a lot of enjoyment. This movie is batshit, and I have no idea if it's genuine or not. It's about a man linking random Christmas traditions that we got mostly from pagans to stuff from the Bible in the most abstract ways. Christmas trees are biblical because they represent the cross and Jesus was hung from a cross. That's the logic. It's terribly made, terribly acted, but it's so innocent. It's like everyone on set was just like, oh boy, we're gonna make a movie. Let's make a movie. And it's gonna tell people to go out and buy things. DeAndre and Ronaldo, and no shit, I cannot remember that character's name, just get a random scene that's never followed up on. DeAndre is every sassy black stereotype and it leads to a random dance number and I don't care what anyone says, Family Force Five's rendition of Angels I Have Heard on High fucking slaps. Yes, I know Kirk Cameron and Darren Doan have said some horrible things, but if you can get past that, this movie is a treat, and I hope to watch it every four years for years to come. I can't say Merry Christmas at work no more. I have to say Happy Holidays, but I am not in the days. Oh. Spider's Web, A Pig's Tail. Yeah, remember this? The first NDTV I ever did, and to this day, one of the funniest experiences I've ever had watching something. I remember first seeing this. I was home for winter break, sophomore year, and me and my brother were in our room watching bad movies, and we saw this, and we laughed so damn hard. I think we had to pause it several times. From the book eating the dog, but not really, it just sort of puts it in its pages. That chicken or rooster that just randomly keeps popping out of nowhere. Those weird alien things that just show up. They try to get one off the roof where they just repeat the same voice line. Then the spider scares her and she flies off. Calm down, Lucy. <laughs> then the TV attacks before they go on a chase scene where the cops launch a missile at them from their motorcycles. <laughs> that happens. The snake host of a game show dies, and then Walter is filming a pirate movie, and he gets blown up and flung across the screen, and I swear to God, my brother and I had to watch that like ten times. Oh, and the moral of the story is don't lie. Unless you can keep your story straight. I have no idea how this world works because they keep mentioning a farmer, but it seems animals run their own cities and businesses, all with that creepy animation with those bugged out eyes. 
So yeah, this is one of the funniest bad movies I've ever seen. And I do respect that it was basically made by one guy, and it's not the worst production I've ever seen. Thank you, Michael Schelk. You gave me and my brother so many laughs, and this film will always hold a special place in my heart. <laughs> Get off this roof! <laughs> it ain't be okay! Biggest fan. This movie is a train wreck in the most fascinating way. Just the act of watching it is an experience that I will never forget. Let's start with the most obvious thing. This movie looks like shit. It's washed out. It's like the negatives were left in the sun and then ran through a bucket of milk. And this is the DVD, not something I got off YouTube, and it looks like it was filmed off of a theater screen. Like, I thought there had to be something wrong with the disc, but no. There's bonus features on there, and they look fine. In fact, one of them, they show an audience watching the movie, and it looks like shit there too. The direction on this is some of the worst I have ever seen. Bad audio, aspect ratio changes, bizarre transitions, terrible editing, using songs that don't fit in some of the worst acting I have ever seen. The main story of Chris and Debbie's romance is so thin that they have to pad it out with weird side stories featuring some of the most bizarre characters ever put to film. Her brother Garfield, who's essentially Hugh Hefner, those two cops from the police academy, Mr. Miyagi, who apparently exposed himself, and the parents, played by actors who unfortunately passed away last year. This movie is just bizarre. I, I can't do it justice. You have to watch it. I have no negative feelings about this movie. For all of its problems, I don't hate the two leads, and I do like the soundtrack. And I meant what I said. Chris Trudesdale actually does an okay job. He unfortunately passed away in 2020 at the far too young age of 34. And if you haven't seen it, his fellow Dream Street bandmates did a tribute song for him. And I will always love him for giving us one of the most bizarre bad movies I've ever seen. How old's that kid? 16. I swear when he grows up, he's going to have more interns than Bill Clinton. City Street Kids Believe in Santa. This special has the worst animation I've ever seen. And the thing is, this story does not need to be animated. You could have easily done this in live action, but if they did, it would have just aired and been forgotten. A mediocre Christmas special no one cares about. But in having this animation, it landed itself in infamy. There are other strange things about this movie. Ricky's rapping, Smithy's sexism, Nicole being absolutely terrible. In fact, every character is kind of mean to each other. The great grandma's speaking voice that was not a glitch according to the voice actress. Random tonal shifts, bad shot composition, and misspelling the word excellence. But all of that takes a back seat to the ugliest animation ever put to screen. And the thing is, the music is really good, as is the voice acting. Even the story itself is mostly fine. It's nothing spectacular, but it seems like everyone is trying their best, not knowing how this was going to look. The story of how this special got made is so incredible, I want to see a documentary on it. I'm almost convinced to make it myself. This special will hold a place in my heart for two reasons. One, it gave me joy at a time when I really, really needed it. As I've said many times, the last half of 2015 was the hardest time of my life. By late November, I was at my lowest point. But watching this made me laugh so hard, it made me forget my troubles for just a little bit. I watched it with my brother too, and he laughed his ass off. And we are still quoting it to this day. Let me know anytime you want to fall down again. Smithy's small and round. He's closest to the ground. Cheap is not cool in A. Get him away from me. Christmas. <laughs> Shut that door. But the other reason is more of a selfish reason. I covered it. First, I reviewed this only four months after Dekaiti put it on his Vimeo page, and I checked before uploading. There were like a few little videos on YouTube about it. Most of them weren't reviews. They were just like 
Here's a clip of great grandma saying something silly. And even the few that were actually talking about it weren't like full fledged reviews. They were only a few minutes long at most. So I felt like one of those people who discovered The Room or Birdemic. I reviewed it first, then a month later Mega Mitch covered it, then a year later we got the trifecta of Rebel Taxi, Mr. Enter, and Bob Show, and then a year after that both the Nostalgia Critic and Phalus, and now it's a cult classic. Colin Slater, the director of this, unfortunately passed away in 2019. So, Mr. Slater, if you can see this in the afterlife, thank you. I know it didn't become the classic in the way you wanted, but this has brought me and so many others so much joy. I'm gonna get you, Smithy! I'm gonna take your sandwich! And that's it. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye.